This is the third in a series of subjects uh, on related to death and what happens to people when they die. I suppose a great many of you have recently viewed the amazing film, The Hiding Place. And in this film, you were deeply impressed by the stability of Christian character. How that people who are devoted to Jesus Christ can go through great hardships and trials and still show Christian love. I suppose the thing that amazed me most about this film was the power of the Word of God in that little home. Some of you know last summer it was our privilege to go to Harlem and to go to the cathedral where Corey Ten Boom worshipped all her life, where she played as a little child, going up there where some of her family had responsibility. And in her early years she played there and she learned to pray there. And around the corner from that cathedral was the home where they lived and the Bible was enthroned in that home and they loved the Word of God. And to this preacher, the most amazing thing about the film was that they smuggled that little Bible in there. And at the time when the pressure was greatest, they would turn to that book and they would read it. And I sat there and the tears came on my cheeks. I could almost hear the voice of Jesus as he said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word, notice, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And I thought about how precious that little book was. And then it struck me like a sword in my heart that I can't even get some people to even open the book to look at the Word of God. Friend, if you don't have a Bible open this morning, for the sake of God, open one right now and look at it. I want you to look at the Word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. So these words are so important. I cannot tell you how for these two weeks, as I've sat here with someone else preaching, how these words have been ringing through my mind and my soul. Uh, we can't get any farther than about four verses this morning. Will you open your Bible now at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, and notice how it begins, For we know. Now let me say in the first place, this passage is for Christians. It is not for unbelievers. No unbeliever can read this passage and understand it. It doesn't mean anything to the unbeliever. But if you are a born-again child of God, then it does mean something to you. For it says, for we, we Christians, we believers, we born-again children of God, we born-again children of God know, and the word is oida, and oida means something that you know and understand and you have the knowledge of it in your mind and you can exhale faith toward God from it. We know this. We don't imagine it. We don't hope so. We don't think it. maybe it may be, but we know. This is knowledge, oida. That's why he uses the word oida. For we know. Now, what do we know? That if third-class condition, now, why in the world does he use a third-class condition? A third-class condition means maybe it's true and maybe it's not. Now, why does he say that? For we know if our earthly house of the tabernacle were dissolved. Well, you say, preacher, our earthly house of the tabernacle is going to be dissolved, isn't it? Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. If the rapture comes, if the second coming of Christ comes while you're still alive, you will not have your earthly body dissolved. And that's why he uses the third class condition, that there will be some, everybody who's died, and their bodies are in the grave, then their body will be dissolved. But if you're still alive when he comes, your body will not be dissolved, and that's the reason he uses the if in a third class condition. So he says if. Maybe, maybe so and maybe not. 
If you're fortunate enough to still be alive when he come, you won't die. You will go straight to be with him, right in your body. You'll be raised right up, right then. But if not, your body will go back to dust, and that sacred dust will be raised up. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive shall be caught up to be with him in the air. So that's the reason he uses a third-class condition, if. So he says, we know. Now what do we know? If our earthly, but it's not earthly exactly, the word earthly here is epigaios, E-P-I-G-E-I-O-S, epigaios. What is epigaios? If this house on earth, if this on earth house, you have an on earth house, you're living in it this morning, your body is your on earth house. Now, if this on earth house Epigaos, earthly he calls it, and house is archaea, this, this uh, shelter really, it's, it's not a permanent place. This house you now live in is not your permanent home. You're living in your body now, it's not your permanent home. You're going to have a permanent one one of these days. This is a tempor temporary shelter. So he says here, if this on earth temporary shelter in which you're living, and then he goes on to clarify a little, this tabernacle, that means a tent, you know, a tent is something you put up and you live in a little while and take it down. So you are living in your on earth shelter, your tent, tabernacle. He says, if it were dissolved, if it were torn down, if it, uh, the word for dissolve is kataluo. Luo means to loose, kata means by a certain form or standard. So he said, if your unearth shelter, on your unearth tent is loosened, if it's dissolved, if it's uh, taken away, if it's, uh, this word, uh, kataluo, means to unfasten, it means to uh, untie. So if this house is taken from you, is what he's talking about. Notice what he says now. Then, now he comes to the positive statement. When this temporary shelter leaves us, what do we have? We have something. And the word is echo. We have, and it means we have it, and we have it forever. We have it, and we hold it. That's the reason he uses echo. We have. What do we have when the tent's taken down? You're living in that tent now. And sometimes uh, it has a feeble heartbeat, and sometimes it has a fever, and sometimes you have this or that wrong with your tent. And it's not going to always be there. But the minute you lose it, you have something forever. What do you have forever? Echo, we have it. Present tense, it means we have it today. A million years from now, we'll still have it. That's the reason he uses echo in the present tense. It'll always be true. We have a building, a kodome, and that's the edification complex. I've taught you about it for many, many months, had it on the front of our directory. What is the edification complex that you have? You don't have the temporary shelter you've been living in, but you have a house that you've been building. And what is it built on? It's built on the Word of God. It's built on grace. It, it's built on inner happiness. It's built on a relaxed mental attitude. It's built on a capacity to love. It's built on a mastery of the details of life. That's the edification complex. And you've built it in your soul, and that's what you're going to take to heaven with you. Friends, you can't take your money. And you can't take your guns or your favorite bird dog or whatever you want to name. You can't take it with you, but I'll tell you what you can take with you. You can take that edification complex in your soul and everything that you know of the Word of God, you'll take with you. And that's why it's so important that you learn. Friend, learn it, learn it, learn it. So when you go to be with God, you'll take it with you. And he says, we have a building. We will go, we'll, the old temporary shelter will be folded up, but we're going to take a building with us. And what is it? The kodome, the building of God. And now he comes to something beautiful. And that's what I call the sermon, the not made with hands house. And this is where I got it, right here. And house, or Ikea, 
not made with hands. Here is a very interesting verse. I want to give you the word that's translated not made with hands. Not is a, ah. Cairo is uh, the word for hand, C-H-E-I-R-O, Cairo. And made is poitos, P-O-I-E-T-O-S. Ah, Cairo poitos is this interesting word. Not handmade. You're going to have a house that's not made with hands. Every house we've ever lived in is a house made with hands. In my office, I have a brick that came from the foundation of my old country home. I went back some years ago when I was in Mississippi to see my old country home and it's not there. I found out from some country neighbors that some years before it had burned to the ground. I couldn't even find where it stood. I looked all around. There were no landmarks there. I tried to visualize it from the trees, but evidently in the fire, the trees that were right around it burned with the fire because there was no fire equipment. That old country home just burned down, burned everything around it. And I kept trying to find, and finally I found a brick. That's all I have from that country home. Except one thing. I have one thing in my home that was in that country home. The clock my father made and moved in our house the day I died, uh, the, the day that I was born. The day I was born, he moved this clock. He had made in a manual training shop there in the school. Moved it in the day I was born, and it started running and ran for all through my boyhood. That's the only thing I have from my country home. The only thing. And I thought about that home. I loved everything about it. Why, friend, I suppose in today's market, you could buy it for $5,000. I guess you could. Just a little country house. But I'll tell you, it meant everything to me because that's where there was joy and laughter. That's where Papa and Mama lived. That's where I learned to pray. That's where I knew when I walked in that house I was secure because my father presided over that house and I knew that I had a hand of love over me. Oh, I loved everything about that house and I cried the day we moved away from it and we left it. But my friend, think of it, it's gone. It's not there at all. That, that little house that we loved, it's gone, and the things that you have, and your house maybe isn't a little $5,000 country home. Maybe your house is, is a very fabulous, lovely home with ornate uh, Persian rugs or whatever you take it, antique furniture, go on and name it, and maybe it cost $100,000, but I'll tell you this, it's going to be torn down, and in its place, you're going to have a not made with hands house. What a house it will be. Not made with hands. You can take the best carpenters and the best skilled laborers in the world and you can build it of stone and brick and it may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, friend, but I'll tell you this, it's going to come down. But you and I are going to move into a house not made with hands. A not made with hands house. We have a temporary shelter now, and it's coming down. And then one day we're going to move over into that not made with hands house. And that's the house that God has provided for every one of us. And if you are a believer, God is going to give it to you. And the minute you move in it, your old sin nature leaves you. And now you are as perfect as God is. And think of living in a not made with hands house as perfect as God is. That's what heaven is going to be like. So you see, that's why I urge you, oh my friend, do you understand why the preacher insists that you take in every word that's in the book, every word. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word in the word of God is so very, very important for you are building you are building that edification complex and with it you're going to live in a not made with hands house. So that's that first verse. Will you look at it one more time? For we know, we Christians, this is just for us. 
not for unbelievers. We Christians, we know that if our earthly house, if Jesus tarries and we are not raptured, we are going to have this happen to us. Our own earth house is going to be folded up. It's going to be dissolved. We'll turn to sacred dust. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We're going to have a not made with hands house. And God is going to provide it for us. What a day it will be when we move into that house. Now I want you to notice how he goes on in this next verse. And this has always been strange to me, and I didn't know what this meant. I've tried to understand it. For in this, in this house that we're living in now, he says, in this temporary shelter, in this lean-to, in this tent, this tabernacle that we're, while we're waiting for that not made with hands house, he says there's something's going on. For in this we groan, stenazo, S-T-N-A-Z-O, stenazo it's pronounced. Why do we groan? It doesn't mean groan really. It means a better translation is sigh. We, we, we sigh. You know, you, you sigh for something that you do not have. A sigh for something means that something is missing. And uh, here is the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian in the world, and yet he says he, is, he sighs for something he doesn't have. He's reaching out for something that's beyond him. So he says, in this we groan, earnestly desiring. This is an intense longing for something. Earnestly desiring. Epipatheo, we are uh, with intensity, it means. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. This is an interesting word that we will, you see, we folded up our old tent now and we don't have it anymore. To be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. I want you to notice this word our house. This is a very, very beautiful word. Our house. It's a different word from that word up there where it says, we know if our earthly house, that word house. This now he used an entirely different word, archaterion. And why does he use archaterion? Because archaterion means that when you move in, you are, from the first moment you move in, you're perfectly happy, and you'll be happy forever. So, friend, when you get to heaven, you're going to be happy forever. Don't let anybody tell you there's going to be unhappiness in heaven. I remember how they used to describe how some would live in big mansions up on the front street, and then if you weren't so good and you didn't obey the Lord like you should, you'd have a little house on the back street preacher came to our church one day and because we had a lot of houses on our farm where the laborers lived and I just imagined I me living in one of those little shanties you know up in heaven well I have news for you that's not going to be true that's not going to be so you're not going to live in any little shanty when you get to heaven you are going to move into your heavenly home and the second you move in it you're going to look around and say this is everything I've always wanted and after you've been there a million years it's still going to be just as good as the day you moved in and you'll for the conclusion of this message stop machine turn cassette over and begin listening to side two at this point everything I've always wanted and after you've been there a million years it's still going to be just as good as the day you moved in and you're never going to want anything more after you get it now my friend that's what death is and when my neighbors came across I was cutting the yard yesterday and my neighbors came across and Ms. Reebstein told me we're going to New Orleans and they said we depend on your prayers more than anybody else for you have been so kind to come again and again and again and she said, won't you please, please pray because my husband calls you his preacher even though he's a Jew. Will you pray for him? Why, well, I said, Ms. Reebstein, I will. And if Dave isn't to be any better, if his faith 
is in Jesus Christ. He will move into that not made with hands house. And when he moves into it, it will be perfect and he'll never want anything else forever. Now this is what this means right here. Notice it says, we will have our house clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We're going to have a house not made with hands from heaven, perfect place. That's the why, as J.L. sang this morning, why of course that's true. The half has never been told. You can't tell it. No way to tell it. This house not made with hands. What it's going to be like. Now we have something interesting coming up in the next verse. And I have allowed time to talk about it for just a minute. Notice he's going to say here, if so be, first class condition now, and this is true. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, I don't know why that uh, when you mention nakedness, people always become a little bit embarrassed and they are squeamish about this and they are shy about it and, and, and they're afraid of nakedness. Well, I want to prepare your mind for something. When you die, if it is before the rapture of the church and your body goes into the grave, you are going into the presence of God with your soul and your spirit and your soul and your spirit is going to be naked. You are going to be in the presence of God with a naked soul and a naked spirit. Now, if that upsets you, I, I can tell you why it does. You know, so many people have thought there's something wrong with nakedness. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were naked and there wasn't a thing wrong with it. The thing that was wrong with it is when they sinned and the devil came and shamed them and said, shame on you, put your clothes on. And they got clothes on and you see, the issue was not clothes for the devil was trying to get their mind off of their sin and get them to think there was something wrong with their nakedness. There wasn't anything wrong with their nakedness. The thing that was wrong is that they had a guilty soul for they disobeyed God. But the devil always wants to get your mind off the main thing so he makes people think that there's something wrong with nakedness. And then there are other psychological reasons. Maybe you've had a dream and you got caught off somewhere without your clothes and couldn't get back and uh, had an awful nightmare experiences like that. Or maybe you were in a fraternity initiation like they did in a certain northern university this winter and they took these boys five miles out of town and stripped them of every a, a bit of clothing and they had to run through the snow five miles back to the dormitory. Well, of course, nakedness is a embarrassing experience if you get caught in something like that. Or there's another reason why nakedness is uh, a little bit embarrassing sometimes and that is maybe you have blemishes on your body and you don't want anybody to see or maybe you are a little protruding in certain places you know and there's there's fat there that you don't want to reveal to somebody. So here he says, I'm preparing you for verse 3. Now, if you think I'm off the subject, I'm not. I'm on verse 3. Notice verse 3, what he says in verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, what does it mean to have a naked soul? What is he talking about here, this word? For nakedness, gumnos, G-U-M-N-O-S, that we will not have a naked soul. What does it mean? He simply means this. My friend, if you are clothed with the word of God, if you know the word of God, if you know the promises of God, if you built this edification complex in your life, you're going to stand in the presence of God. Peter is there today, Paul, John, Mary Magdalene. They're all there standing before God in naked souls in their perfection. And my friend, they are perfectly happy. Now, I do not know why the Bible brings this in except so that we could know that the minute you go to be with God, 
that even in a naked soul you will be perfectly happy, you will be perfectly at home, you won't be running around trying to pick up some clothing somewhere to clothe your nakedness because you're standing there in front of the all-seeing eye of God and every imperfection that you have is now changed in the glory of his perfection and you stand there just as perfect as God in, in a naked soul and a naked body and then one day at the right moment you're going to pick up that old body and when you pick it up it is going to clothe you and you're going to be clothed with a perfect resurrection body. Nobody will wear clothing in heaven because we will be clothed in the perfection of God. And that's better than any clothing you can ever buy. So here is something very, very beautiful. Paul describes this as being very attractive. He says, we're going to move out of the on earth house and we're going to move into the not made with hands house and we're going to live forever and ever with God and we will have a naked soul but we will be clothed in the perfection of God. Now my friend, that's what's going to happen to you when you die. So remember, the greatest day that you will ever live is going to be the day you die. Then we have time for just another verse. Would you look at it please? Verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle, as long as you're in this on earth house, we do groan. And why do we sigh? Why do we, all these problems that we have down here, being burdened, and the word is bereo, it means we carry heavy burdens, we have heartaches and problems. We being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. We are carrying all kinds of heavy burdens in this life. But he says that we might be clothed upon, that we might wear the garments of God. We're unclothed, but that we might be clothed. And this is the love of God, the beauty of God, the joy of God, the perfection of God. So this is why we groan. Then notice verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for this self-same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of his spirit. Notice verse 6. Therefore we are always confident knowing that. Now my friend, to know these things is very, very, very important. And I don't want you to forget. Someone said to me, Preacher, do you think that we ought to talk so much about death I think we should because in the last six weeks I've stood by 16 graves. Another one yesterday afternoon, 16 of our people who a year ago were here listening and watching, they are gone now. We are facing it all the time. And my friend, the greatest appointment you have is the day they announce, they call up and they say to the preacher, so and so has died. Why it simply means you've moved out of your on earth house and you've moved into the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And heaven is going to be a very, very wonderful, wonderful place for you. And so he says in verse 6, and with this we close, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, now this is oida, this is knowledge that you will have forever, and no death can't take it away from you. You'll lose many things when you die, but you will not lose the knowledge that you have of the Word of God. You will not lose your edification complex. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. While we are in this temporary house, we cannot be with God. But the minute we move out of this temporary house, we move into the permanent abode where we will be with God forever. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, we are confident. Notice the word. We know and we are confident. We have absolute confidence. We're not guessing. We're not, it's not supposed, hoping maybe, but we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, but to be present with the Lord. Verse 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. Let's bow our heads 
and close our eyes. And while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I ask you to think on these things. We have just closed a revival meeting and many of you have sat through some of the greatest preaching you've ever heard in your life. And some of you were challenged to accept Christ. Some of you were challenged to walk down the aisle and join the church on promise of your letter. Some of you who are not Baptists or in other denominations, but you come here because you like to hear the word of God taught. But you didn't make your decision. And now I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision this morning. In just a moment, when we sing our invitation hymn, I want you to get up out of your seat and walk down the aisle and take your stand for Jesus Christ or come on promise of your letter to join the church. Now, we don't do differently from the invitations we've had in recent days. We will just remain seated while we sing. And while we remain seated, I want every person in this house to pray a prayer. If there's anybody on your row who is unsaved, anybody on your row who is not in the church, I want you to pray that they will get up out of their seat and they will come right now. Will you pray that prayer? And we will wait. Nobody will be in a hurry. I've given a little longer for this invitation because I know there may be some who ought to make decisions, and it may be a hard decision. Maybe you hadn't planned to do it when you came this morning, but I want you to come. So we will pray while the choir sings, Will You Come Right Now?